In this segment, we're going to do a little bit more RF modding to some of your gear. In this case, I've got some, some wireless sticks. I've got Bluetooth and USB. But before we get into the sticks, let's get into some of the tools that you really should have on hand. Soldering iron, 35 watt. Make sure your tip is as sharp as you can get it. Some uh, standard everyday solder. Desoldering braid, or also known as desoldering wick. This is great stuff if you get solder in places that you don't want solder to be. Um, tools, we got some some form of small little pliers and such. I've got some surgical equipment, but needle nose pliers or even tweezers will do just fine. But two of the tools that I've actually made myself, I took some X-Acto knife, uh, knife bodies, some hobbyist knife bodies. This is just housing a standard sewing needle. This makes a very nice precision pick. This is actually one of my homemade lock picks, um, also inside of an X-Acto knife or a hobbyist knife body. Also good for poking around some very small surface mount stuff. Cutters, strippers, strippers, uh, having some kind of desktop vise, which I've got right here. I'll zoom up into a little bit later. Um, multimeter. Uh, continuity check to make sure that all your, all your connections are nice and solid. And you'll need, of course, some kind of coax cable. The cable that I'll be using in this segment is um, LMR100. You can also use something called RG316. However, it's only rated for 1.6 gigahertz. In short runs, it will work, but I wouldn't recommend it. This cable was actually sacrificed out of an old laptop. This connector on here is actually a, a UFL or a high res connector that plugs into a mini PCI Wi-Fi card. This is the antenna that actually went inside the screen itself. It's not a very great antenna, but it's still better than the uh, printed circuit board mount that you have on top of these cards. I'll put a little bit more detail on where to get your coax and what kind of uh, connections you can use. Because these cards are so damn small, it's really damn near impossible to get any kind of any kind of LMR195 or anything soldered to them. So you're going to need to have some kind of you know, brain cells. You need to have an IQ above room temperature and you need to be a little bit ingenuitive. As for the cards, these I just call wireless sticks. And this, this is a Bluetooth, this is a Wi-Fi. I got more Bluetooth, got another Wi-Fi. Opening them up is relatively simple. You just stick your thumbnail or another flat object. I would not recommend using any kind of um, like screwdrivers because that will mar the sides. You put your finger on the side and they'll just pop right open. They just have little pop tabs, just like any household remote control will. Here's a, a Wi-Fi card one. Just stick a, some kind of plastic tool or your fingernails in. Slide it down. Just like you're cracking open an oyster or a shell of some sort. So that shouldn't be all too hard. If you cannot get these things open, again, I really don't feel that you, are, uh, you have the, the intelligence or the technical competence to be messing inside one of these things, so don't do it. I'm going to go in, uh, because these things are really small, I'm going to go ahead and readjust some of these in my desktop vise and readjust the camera so we can get a better angle and understand what the inner workings of the antennas of these are and how to modify them so we can solder some coax onto them. Here we have the internals of a, of a D-Link DBT120 Bluetooth USB adapter. Now, if you notice real closely, you'll see this, this track right here. This will lead all the way into the signal of what would should be an RF box. There's no RF shielding over here, which I'll explain in a moment. This is the antenna right here. If you've noticed that there's no no ground plane, normally the RF shielding that would go over all of this, that would actually go right over here on top of all of these chips, there'd be ground. There'd be a nice big metal plate you can solder onto. Like if you remember from the USB adapter segment, but this one doesn't have one. But if you notice that they have these little holes, like these little, what they're called vias, they just lead to the bottom side of the board. And they also have this nice silver bead of solder all the way around. That can also all be used for your ground. And what you can do is you can just take your coax and solder it like so. But what you, what you have to do is you have to make sure that you actually sever this, this wire right here and make sure you pull away uh, the signal from the antenna right here. So you're just going to take a razor blade, or even I can, I can even use this pick and I'd scrape away until this track was completely broken and this antenna was now deactivated. Then I can use the pick as well to scrape away a lot of this green lacquer and then tin this, this solder track. But you have to be very careful. Don't use an insanely hot soldering iron because the, the heat that will be conducted into the track could, it, it could conduct so fast that it just makes the track burn straight off of the board. So this would actually be a worst case scenario. This adapter is very difficult to modify. Um, I'd stay away from it if possible, but usually when you buy a USB 
wireless stick, Wi-Fi, or Bluetooth, you don't know what you get until you've actually purchased it, unless you can get the FCC ID. If you remember in previous segments and previous episodes, I've used the FCC database lookup quite a few times to get internal pictures of all of the USB adapters before I purchase them. Here we have the internals of a very generic, like, 11 or $8 USB Wi-Fi adapter. It's actually based off of a Zydas 1211 chipset. Over here, there's this ceramic inductor. An inductor is a coil of wire, and this inductor over here will actually take the place of that coil of wire that was on that printed circuit board. This is actually a very poor antenna. It also, this is the signal wire right here, and then it leads straight up this way to an inductor, which fools the card into thinking that there's a set amount of wire. Now, later on, most likely in a, an episode or two, I'll be getting into antenna design so I, you can understand why this doesn't work very well. But here's also a very awkward property that I've noticed that a lot of manufacturers are doing. This wire coming underneath the, the RF shield is usually the signal wire. This is where your signal comes from. But if you notice, it loops back around to the metal shielding. And if we actually take the multimeter and put it to a, continu a continuity test, we can verify that the shield and the signal are tied together. And this is not a good thing. This is a very bad idea. So what you have to do is when you first you'd have to remove this component right here. And the second thing you'd have to do is actually break away to make sure that the shield is now separated from the signal because that is just not a good thing to do. That's just I have no idea. The only thing I can think of, I've talked to Ophidian, I've talked to Dave, both of them into, into amateur radio, as well as 2.4 gigahertz wireless, that's their jobs, and neither of them, nor any of their engineering friends, can understand why this was actually made like this. The only best guess is to try to create a very, very crappy, unbalanced dipole antenna. So, if you wanted to take that off, you would take your soldering iron, now, I'm going to try to do this on frame, but this is very difficult. And you would heat up one side. Now, I would recommend heating up, like this pad over here is actually tied to nothing. Absolutely nowhere, nothing, nada. We take our continuity tester, nothing. Not hooked to shield, it's not hooked to ground. So, that pad is just there to hold that, that component in place. So we're going to take our soldering iron, we're going to take our pick, we're just going to heat this up, and boom, it's gone. It was that easy. It, the end. From there, you just go and take, like I said, you take a very s small razor. In this case, I've got a surgical scalpel. And we would just cut this track, which is very hard to do without shaking everything. But either way, once that track is cut, it's a matter of just taking a little bit of solder. And I'll probably do this off frame so I don't make the segment too long. So take a little bit of solder, pre tin it there. You can use the shield as ground, as always, or you can either, either just solder directly onto here. Using your, continuity, using your continuity meter, you can actually find other various points for your ground. Usually any kind of shield or any kind of like negative voltage return can be used as a ground point. From here, you just solder on your coax as normal. You put your center conductor coming out of, of, of the coax, coming straight out of the signal, and you'd solder your ground to the ground, just like we did with the, the USB sticks, uh, the USB adapters. It's just this is a much smaller scale. Here is another very inexpensive USB Wi-Fi stick. I have no idea what chipset. I don't know who makes it. But if you notice that there's a test jack over here that looks very similar to a Hyros connector. However, if we try to put a high rose or a UFL connector in here, it won't stay. Now, you'll notice, I hope you can notice, underneath here, there's a track that leads to this test connector, leads away into some passive components, and then what used to be another one of those inductor coils, which I've removed because of previous projects. Over here is where, again, you'd solder your signal, and then using the shielding, you can see where I have a little bit of solder, I see I've used it as shield. It's that simple. I mean, it's, it's, as long as you have the coax and the soldering capabilities, this is very simple. Here we have another inexpensive Bluetooth adapter, just a generic chipset. And again, here is the inductor coil 
that creates the mass of the antenna. And again, you'll actually notice here's the signal wire, but it also loops back around to shield yet again. This track going, the square track going all the way around is adequate enough shielding for the uh, Bluetooth radio. So again, we'd have to desolder this. It's never, never a very difficult task, just a matter of taking your iron and putting enough pressure. There we go. Completely removed. That was the amassment of the antenna. Again, you'll have to go in and you'll have to separate the signal trace from ground because this is just a not, not a proper way of doing things. They're, like I said, the reason they do this is to create uh, a balanced or unbalanced dipole antenna. So you go in and you break that away a little bit. You solder your, your signal to, that, to the signal and you solder your shield to your shield. Just like the USB, just like PCMCA, just like everything, just a lot smaller. Things just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This is a TrendNet TBW105UB USB Bluetooth adapter. And yes, it is Linux compatible. As usual, we have a typical antenna right over here. And it traces all the way back to a surface mount component right here, which you probably can't see. But the thing that intrigues me the most is if you look on the bottom side here, they have this little solder pad, and if you remember the PCMCAA Wi-Fi segment, this solder pad, when used with the continuity meter, I've actually verified that this, let's see if I can get this on, on record. Here's the shield, and there's the shield of the USB. Shield of USB. Verified, that's shield. Now what I've done is, which you probably can't see, I scraped away some of this green lacquer coating right there. So you probably just see it as a small little copper speck right there. And what I've done, I'll try to do this on film for you guys, is I wanted to verify that those two points were actually touching. If I remember correctly, it actually has to pass through a single passive component just like the PCMCIA. And that passive component is right here. I'm trying to touch it right now, but you guys probably can't see. Hey. Look at that. Now, how did I know that this passive component actually led to the actual signal? It's simple, because, right, let me get on frame here. It's actually quite simple. Here's the antenna. I followed the circuit trace all the way back using my multimeter. Here, let's see if I can get this up a little bit higher. My multimeter, continuity test. Here's the trace that I've uncovered that lets me test the antenna where it leads to, and there it goes. So this component right here needs to be removed and possibly rotated. But to be god honest, it is so small, I honestly don't think that it can be removed and rotated. Um, I have quite a bit of, of soldering experience, and I don't really think I can do it. So live on camera right now, I'm going to try. Wow, this thing is really small. Like, holy crap, this thing is really small. Wow, I honestly don't think I can do this. I think the best part of uh, I think the best idea out of this is just take it and throw it away.